Hi, I'm Jamie Majic, Education Consultant with the Wisconsin Valley Library Service. Here is another recorded webinar called Infinite Tech Questions, Itty Bitty Working Space. Our presenter is Teresa Schmidt, the Director of the Mercer Public Library. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Teresa Schmidt. I'm the director of the Mercer Public Library and I'm going to talk to you today about doing uh, technology help programs at your public library. I first gave this talk at the Wisconsin Association of Public Libraries conference in the spring of 2022 and um, we felt like this might be some relevant information for a lot of you people out here that were not in, at the conference so I'm going to record this and uh, I welcome your questions at any time. You see my email address there on the screen. If you need to reach out to me please feel free to do so. So, so what made me think to do this presentation is that I've been doing tech help presentations at my library for many years. And uh, one day I had a really good series of tech help sessions right in a row. I was answering all kinds of questions and it just made me feel like I had phenomenal cosmic powers. And then I looked at my desk with all the work piling up and the things happening in my library. And I was reminded of my itty bitty living space. I'm at a pretty small library and um, finding time for these technology programs is a challenge because you know, every minute that you're not at your desk as the director, things add up, um, things happen and, and more things get added to your to-do list. But I feel like this is really important stuff for my community and that's why I keep doing it. So I thought I'd talk a little bit today about um, how how I put together tech programming, how I make decisions around what services that we're offering at my library, and hopefully it will be helpful to some of you. So just so you know where I'm coming from, I am the director of the Mercer Public Library in Mercer, Wisconsin. We're a pretty small town. We have about 1,600 regular residents. Our population just about triples in the summertime with vacation property owners and visitors. We do have 2,300 cardholders, give or take. Um, and we do what we do with just two staff members, myself and one circulation assistant. Um, we have about a 5,000 square foot library, so it's not that itty bitty, but it's fairly small. Um, an important thing about our community in, is that Iron County, where Mercer is located has is one of the oldest communities in the state. Our median age is 61.8 years old. We have about 42 and a half percent of our residents in the county are over the age of 65. So we have a lot of retirees and older Americans living in the in the community and that has a big effect on the kinds of questions and services that we get asked for at the library when it comes to technology. Now I have an engineering background actually and I used to design websites for a living. So I love technology and I love staying sharp with it. So this is kind of a no-brainer for me. It's something that I enjoy doing and I want to be able to share it with others. Uh, but not everyone feels comfortable about technology. And I've had some people tell me that they just can't do what we do. And I'm here to tell you that you don't have to be a nerd to do this. You don't have to love technology. You don't have to... Um, you don't have to be really, really good at technology because most of you are already better with technology than most of your patrons. Um, the fact that you use a computer every day, even just to do email and interact with your library's ILS, maybe you do Word documents, maybe you do some Excel spreadsheets when you're doing reading lists and other things. Those are all skills that many of your patrons don't have. And you, you are going to naturally have a better co a comfort level with technology than many of those patrons. You also don't need one really tech savvy employee at your library to take the, on the burden of doing all of this kind of programming. You really want to help all of your staff be more familiar with the tech questions that you get so that you can share that workload. So today's program, we're going to talk about why I believe that technology help is a library service. I'm going to talk to you about how to keep yourself and your staff up to date. I'm going to talk about planning and setting limits, which is really important when you're planning your tech help services. And I'm going to talk about how to bring an attitude that's really helpful for you and your patrons to the whole thing. Um, this presentation is geared towards smaller libraries, but I think a lot of larger libraries can learn things too. What we're not going to do today is actually give you any technology training. That's a whole separate topic. So why even bother doing this? Why is this an important goal for libraries? I would never argue that every library has to do anything. Our libraries are as varied as the communities that we serve. But that said, it is 2022. And 
I would argue that for most libraries, it really is important. Um, obviously, because you're here, you're interested in the topic, you probably agree with me. Uh, but when I first started doing technology help at my library, I did have to convince my library board that it was a good use of our time and a good service for our community. Um, technology literacy is kind of defined as the ability to use, manage, understand, and assess technology. And in 2022, technology literacy really goes hand in hand with information literacy. Um, people who understand technology are less likely to be the victim of a scam. Um, they're less likely to take fake news to be uh, real news. They're more likely to be able to meet their information needs. They can better access services that are many of them, which are now just provided by accessing them through the internet. Um, so this is an important topic. Um, especially during, during the pandemic. We've seen how technology literacy has made a huge difference for people who need to stay connected to access resources um, like telehealth and things like that. So this is really vitally important for your patrons. Um, you should consider your community when you're planning these things and whether or not you're going to offer technology at all. Um, I mentioned earlier that Mercer has a lot of senior citizens. We have a lot of retirees who live here without family close by. So they, they sometimes come in and they say, well, my kids aren't close, so I can't ask them. Even if their kids were close, though, a lot of times family members aren't the best person to ask for advice on all kinds of topics, but especially on technology, because you really need someone who's patient and willing to sit and work with somebody through their issues, not just take over and do it for them. Um, you should also think about what else is available in your community. So in Mercer, our technical, our technical college is over 50 miles away from us. So we don't have that resource close by for people. Even if you do have resources in your community, excuse me for that. Um, even if you do have resources available in your community, you uh, want to ask yourself, are they freely available for your residents? Um, do people have barriers to accessing that help if they need it? And it's not just senior citizens that need technology help. Everyone benefits from technology literacy. Technology literacy is not just a problem for the elderly. Colleges find there's there's a huge digital divide that impacts low-income minority, minority learners, especially first-generation college students. Uh, when families only have access to the internet using smartphones, they don't develop the same kind of technology literacy skills as families who have computers at home or have access to other kinds of technology resources. And in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, but I, I'm a parent of students in middle and high school now, and even schools with one-to-one -one technology programs aren't really helping to make up that gap because what they're offering to students are oftentimes tablets or Chromebooks that are managed by the school district. And they're locked down with filters and blocks and spyware, and they give kids access the, to the technology they need to get their homework done, but they don't allow the kids to actually manage the device for themselves um, because they can't customize it, they can't troubleshoot it, they can't change their settings. They're really not allowed to do anything with those devices other than their homework. So it's not giving them the same technology literacy skills that we think that young people have. Um, they're, they're, they're learning how to be good tech users, but they're not learning how to really understand the technology in the way that I wish that they were. And uh, it's worth noting that the Wisconsin Public Library Standards do emphasize that this is an important topic for libraries as well. It is part of those standards. So, um, so I hope I've convinced you that technology training plays an important role in a, in a public library. So now the question is, how do you get it done? I know you have limited resources, we all do. Our staff time is one of the biggest limits that we have. Um, so how do you make this work in your small library? Um, it's kind of tough love time. You can't accept excuses from your staff anymore that they just don't get technology or they, they're not very good at it. Um, you need to have more than one just techie librarian that handles these requests. You need to be sharing this work with all of your staff and you need to think of ways that you can help all of your staff become more comfortable with the technology that you're promoting in your library through digital services, as well as the technology that people are asking about for technology help. Um, and now, if you have a st staff member who's truly has a phobia about technology, they may not be the best choice for this, but most people can learn enough skills to be helpful to your patrons. As I said, just simply working in a library already sets you ahead of uh, many people in your community in terms of what your comfort level with technology is. So um, yeah, it's time for everybody to stay up to date on technology.
You don't really have to keep up with everything, honestly. You don't need to know everything. You just have to know how to find out what you need to know. And that's what librarians are best at. We're really good at looking things up. We're really good at um, using our research skills and our analytical brains to find the access, uh, the information that we need on the fly. And that's really what it's about. It's not about understanding every software package. It's not about having the answers right at your fingertips. It's about demonstrating a learning mindset for your patrons and um, showing showing them how they can seek out answers that they might not already know. So first thing we want to do, though, is, is instead of thinking of ourselves as knowing everything about technology, we want to start thinking of ourselves as being technology aware. Um, being tech aware to me means keeping your ears and eyes open about technology trends. It means having a willingness to learn about new technology. It is not about already knowing everything. So how do you support yourself and your staff into becoming more technology aware? Um, well, first, you can assess what you already have. You probably have more skills in your staff members than you realize. You you want to you want to know who on your staff is is personally using an Android phone, who's using an iPhone, who's using uh, an iPad or other kind of tablet, who is uh, a gamer on your staff. All of those different skills. Who likes to use their e-reader or their Kindle? All of those are skills that patrons ask about. So if I know in my library, for example, that I have a patron coming in with a question about an Android phone, I'm probably going to refer them to my colleague because my colleague is. An Android phone user, and she's much more familiar with that um, that phone setup than I am as an iPhone user. So you already have a lot of those skills in your staff, and if everybody's willing to pitch in and help with those kinds of questions, then you have a lot more people that can share that workload. Um, another great way to stay tech aware is to keep your personal devices up to date. And so when a new phone um, operating system release comes out, upgrade your phone and then go through the tutorials, learn about what's new. That will keep your mind fresh, not only about the newest operating system, but also it'll keep you in that mindset of the constant change of technology and how you adapt to it as you, um, as you see things changing basically every day. That's what throws a lot of patrons off and it throws a lot of library staff off too. Um, but it doesn't have to if you practice it. If you practice being uncomfortable with the changes that might have just happened to your phone, you get better with it over time. So um, there are also a lot of resources available to most libraries to help them with this. Uh, there are digital magazines in OverDrive, for example. Um, so these on the screen are just three of the of the magazines that are available in that um, Wisconsin Digital Library collection. They're fairly recent titles. These books that are written or magazines that are written under the four seniors title, they tend to be um, they tend to emphasize basic features of devices, but that can be really useful for you and your staff when you're trying to just understand how to navigate around an, an unfamiliar device. Um, Wisconsin's Digital Library also includes all kinds of titles like PC World, Mac World, PC Magazine, Wired, um, and I, I think the last time I looked there were about 400 magazines in the gaming and technology tech um, section of that digital library, and all of those are obviously available to you as library staff members, and browsing through those magazines, not reading every article or every word of every page, but just browsing through them will help you maintain an awareness of some of the new things that are out there, and um, again, and just keep your mind in the practice of learning about new technology things. You also have a lot of partners in the community that you can use to help you provide technology programming. So the Aging and Disability Resource Centers have a program called Sip and Swipe, which is a training program for seniors on um, tablets like iPads. That's kind of a fun thing that you might be able to partner with the ADRC to come and present that for you. You may have a, a technical college that's closer to you and they may be able to provide classes at your library, although often those aren't free for your community members to participate in, but bringing those into your library may make them more accessible for some of your patrons at least. Um, some public schools have community education programs, and so your local public school may be a source for teaching classes, and public school community ed programs tend to be more affordable than the technical college programs. They're also less um, in-depth, typically, but for many of your patrons, they don't want like a college-level course on technology. They want an evening course on how do I back up windows, those kinds of, you know, more... Um, targeted courses about certain issues rather than delving into a whole semester's worth of content about something. 
You may have community volunteers that can help you with some technology programming. You may have some seniors who are uh, some retirees who are tech savvy that might want to volunteer some time. Uh, teenagers often have to do community service hours and maybe they can help you um, with some technology training. But I want to emphasize that whenever you're using volunteers, whether they're seniors or teens or anybody else, um, you want to be careful because people sometimes think they know more than they actually do. And teenagers uh, may be good technology users, but they may not have the skills to really relate to your library patrons. They may, they probably don't have the skills to sort of put together a class about technology. So sometimes your volunteers will require an awful lot of help from you, but it can still be a good partnership um, if, it, if you find the right volunteers and it makes sense in your situation. Um, some state level organizations also have some great resources that they share with libraries. So one example here is the Wisconsin Bureau of Consumer Protection. I've had them come and do several uh, programs at my library about scams. And um, they have some great programming specifically about scams that are found on the internet and how patrons can avoid them. And they have done those programs virtually for me during the pandemic, and they've done them in person more recently as well. So they're a great resource and, and they don't charge for their programming. They do um, some outreach periodically so you can reach out to them. And there may be other agencies as well that have um, relevant programming on this topic. And again, if you're talking about keeping all of your staff involved in this, you want to make technology training part of your staff continuing education, but that doesn't have to be super formal. It can be something as simple as allowing staff to read an issue of a technology magazine during slow periods at the front desk, for example. Even if that's on the digital collection, they could be paging through PC World on an evening when there aren't too many patrons to be helping. Um, Another great idea is to give your staff tasks to do um, for practice, especially related to your digital services. So you may want to come up with a simple list of, you know, download Dibby, Libby to your mobile device, log in with your library card, download some items or read a magazine on Libby just for the practice so that they can answer questions when they crop up from your uh, patrons. Uh, maybe they should try out some of your other digital services if you have Hoopla or Canopy or Gale Courses or um, LinkedIn Learning or any of those things. You know, give your staff some of those tasks to practice on when there are quiet times in the library, especially your front facing staff, because they may be the ones who are receiving those informal questions from your patrons as they crop up. Um, one thing that I find helps as well is to keep a little notebook with a list of the kinds of questions that you're getting from patrons about technology. Um, because first of all, you can use that as a staff training exercise so the staff can browse through there and say, oh, here's a question that's come up twice in the last month and I don't know the answer. I better, I better look that up. It also helps you determine like if you're getting a lot of questions about a certain topic, maybe you want to teach a class on it. Um, and sometimes that notebook is great for capturing some library stories too. You know, you can jot down that you helped somebody access, um, say MailChimp, for example, and they were able to send their first business newsletter thanks to help at the library. Those are great stories that you can use later in your advocacy work. So um, those notebooks can be helpful helpful for all kinds of reasons. Um, and then I would really recommend considering purchasing a tablet or other device for staff practice um, because you can't always expect staff to be doing these things when they're practicing on their own devices. It's often not appropriate for your staff to use their personal cell phone like during a technology help session. You want them to have something that's issued by the library if you can um, so that they can use it during those, those tech help sessions as a demonstration for the class or um, as a second device so that they can be searching up the answer to a question while the patron is working on something. Um, and also then again, for, for the staff to have something to practice on during their downtimes when they wanna go through some of, those, some of those questions and tasks that you've laid out for them. And before you know it, if you did all those things, before you know it, you'd be doing it. Just like Robin Williams and Hook, if you believe you can do it, you can do it. And it just kind of happens gradually over time. Nobody starts out really knowing how to use technology, but the more times you practice, the more comfortable you will be with learning new things about technology. And that's really what it's all about. It's not about knowing all of the technology that exists. It's about being comfortable learning the new things as they come out. So now that we've talked a little bit about building your skills and your staff skills, let's talk about how to plan services that can work into your library schedule with the resources you have available to you. 
So one of the first things you're going to think about is whether to offer individual instruction or classes or some combination of the two. Um, so one-on-one -on -one drop in programs are really helpful for a lot of folks. Before the pandemic, I offered a program that I called Tech Tuesday, and I would set aside two hours every Tuesday afternoon. People could just drop in and ask me questions about technology. A lot of times I would have people dropping in who didn't have any questions, but they said, I'm just, I learned so much from what other people are asking that they wanted to be there and kind of just absorb that information around them, which is great. Um, but it's also a great opportunity for people to come in when they don't have something that's so formal that they want to set an appointment with you. It's just a quick question or so they think. Um, and they just want to drop in and get an answer to it real quick. So um, I think one-on-one -on -one drop in programs are great and I would like to get back to that. I haven't quite gotten back to that because of the pandemic. I don't want people hanging out in a room together. So what I've been doing for the last few years is one-on-one um, -on -one technology help by appointment. I still encourage people to do that on Tuesdays because for me as the you know half of the staff in my library I cannot give up every day of the week to do technology programming even though I bet my community would use it if I did um, so I try to corral as many of those appointments as I can onto the, a single day of the week and, and tell them still let's do Tech Tuesday and then I have the other days of my week when I have a little more free time um, I do make appointments though if people can't come on a Tuesday I do them at other times as well um, and the nice thing about appointments is that you can ask people what you're going to talk about when they make the appointment. So you have the opportunity to do a little research on it yourself if you're not familiar with it. Um, you can remind them of things like make sure you bring your passwords, make sure you bring your power cord for your device, make sure you bring all the, you know, the accessories you might want, like your mouse for your laptop or any of those things. Um, and then the other reason that appointments are nice is because a lot of times people want help accessing digital services that might be a little bit personally sensitive. Um, just this week, I helped an, an older woman get access to our local clinic's website because she wanted to chat with one of the nurses through their message system. And that's not something you want to do when other people are watching. Uh, maybe people need help accessing their bank website. Maybe they have questions about um, you know, looking up stock prices or who knows what, but not everybody wants to do those things in the public eye. So appointments are great for that kind of thing. Classes can also be very helpful um, because you're going to reach more people that way. If you can find topics that bring people out, um, they will be, um, it'll, you'll be able to reach many of them at the same time, which is great. Um, if you have been keeping that notebook about, you know, asking people or jotting down what people are asking about, you have a good resource to look at and say, oh my goodness, like three different organizations have asked about this topic in the last month, maybe I should do a class. And that's how I came to do a class not too long ago on um, using Excel to keep a membership list and then using mail merge with Microsoft Word to send out a membership mailing because we have a lot of lake associations and, and clubs and small groups in the, org in the community that want to do those things and don't have the skills to do them. They needed to learn how to do it. So um, I did a mail merge class and that was pretty successful. Um, so that was kind of a single class. You can you can get all of that into a single class. It's a bit of a challenge because that's a complicated thing to keep a list and then mail merge. Um, but series classes work great when you have like a deeper topic that you want to dive into. I try to keep a class to about 45 minutes if I can, because that's a long time for someone to listen and absorb information. So if you have a topic that you can't address easily in 45 minutes, then you could think about doing a series of classes about it. Um, my favorite class I ever did was a four-part series on information literacy that included um, a lot of technology literacy topic topics, and it was for a local senior education program, and they like longer classes, so I did four 90-minute classes on information literacy for senior citizens, and that was great, um, and I was able to refer to the American uh, ACRL, I can't remember what the acronym stands for right now, the ACRL framework for information literacy for higher education to help me develop the curriculum for that, so sometimes there are curriculum resources out there that you can use. Um, I want to talk just very briefly about the difference between a lecture and a workshop. So work lectures are just me talking, kind of like today. You're just listening to me talk. That's fine. But when you're talking about technology, it really helps for people to get their hands on something and practice it while they're learning with a teacher. And that's really what I would call a workshop. It encourages people to follow along with their own devices. So you would encourage them to bring their tablet, if that's what you're talking about, or their laptop, and follow along with the steps that you're doing. Um, 
And so, for example, if you're doing an email class, you might have people actually register for an email account and you might have them send an email. But workshops go much more slowly than classes do. You really can't cover very much information. You really have to think in advance about keeping your agenda for a workshop very, very short because you're going to get questions. You're going to have to walk around and help people who can't quite figure out what you're doing. Um, and so it really is a slower process. So make sure when you're planning a workshop that it's a pretty limited topic so that you don't have to spend uh, too much time on it because people will lose interest and then, then they haven't learned very well. Whenever you're planning technology programming, limits are important. Um, you, you really need to set some limits, especially for one-on-one -on -one help, because if you don't, you end up way too deep into other people's issues. This is about teaching people the skills they need. It's not about doing the tasks for them. So um, I do set some guidelines on my one-on-one -on -one appointments. Um, we set time limits. You might choose to say only one 30-minute appointment per month, for example, if you're a big library and you don't have a lot of staff for appointment time. You might to be able to say you could do that once a week. You might be able to be flexible about it. But I think when I set an appointment with someone, I do tell them that it's going to be no more than 45 minutes of my time. Um, and I try to keep it to 30 minutes if I can. I also set some rules. I don't do anything if someone has broken hardware. Um, I, I just don't do hardware fixes at all. That's not my role as a librarian. I teach you how to use your device. I don't fix it for you. Similarly, I don't do anything with malware recovery. So I don't want the liability of what happens if I, if someone brought their laptop to me and I told them that I got all that spyware out of there and I really didn't. I don't want to deal with that. So those are two rules that I, I do refer people on to a professional in the community if they have a hardware problem or um, they suspect that they actually have any malware in their computer. Um, so a few other limits that I do set. So I don't do anything for people with their personal information. I will sit with them and help them understand how to fill out a job application, but I will never type in their information for them. I will never type in a credit card number for someone who's trying to order something online. And I get asked that question a lot. And if they're not able to type in their own credit card number, I don't feel comfortable even, even helping them shop online, basically. Um, so um, that's just, again, a big liability. I don't wanna know people's credit card numbers or other personal identifying information. Um, I also don't create documents for people as a general rule. Um, you know, sometimes I violate that with certain community organizations as a partnership, but for technology help, I do not actually do the work for a patron. They have to be the ones sitting at the computer doing the driving. I'm just sort of navigating for them. So I will help them create their own documents, but I will not type their letters for them or do any of their document creation. And just like any other library service, I do not provide legal advice or financial advice or medical advice or any of those things. So if people are looking things up on the internet about those topics, I will help them to be able to identify good resources. I will help them learn how to search better, but I will not um, you know, say, this is the article you need to read for your problem or give them any other kind of advice. Um, you can make compassionate decisions based on your patron's needs. So um, you have to be careful, though. I once called Consumer Cellular for a patron because she's hard of hearing and she couldn't get her phone registered online. We tried and we had to do it with a phone call and she couldn't hear on the phone. So I helped her with that. And then for the next couple of months, she thought I was available to do all of her phone calls for her. So you really do, if you if you violate some of these rules, you have to be clear to say, I'm doing this one time only for you because I have time today or because you're my friend or because whatever the issue might be. Um, so that's a, that's a big thing. It's also helpful to... Um, know some local computer professionals that you can refer people to when they need it. So I mentioned on the last slide that I don't do any hardware fixes or malware recovery. I do have the names of a few local tech people that I will refer library patrons to in those cases. So sometimes you can't, sometimes you have to say no, but it's nice to be able to direct people on where to go next. So a word about the bane of everyone's existence who does technology help, and that is passwords. It's one of the trickier aspects of technology help because a lot of patrons just simply don't understand how passwords work. They get confused about the difference between a user ID and a password. Um, 
They don't know their passwords. They don't even know that their accounts have a password. Some patrons have been looking at their email for years on their smartphone and the phone remembers the password. They don't even know the password exists. Uh, maybe somebody else set it up for them and they never actually had the password. It's hard to know. And password recovery can be really difficult to walk patrons through. Sometimes it's easy if, if the patron has given the, um, the website their phone number and they can do a two-factor authentication. It's pretty easy to help a patron through that. But I always, whenever the, the issue is a password, I always start by saying, I may not be able to help you with this, but we'll try for a little bit and see how it goes. Um, and again, when you're setting appointments, it's nice to be able to remind people, bring your passwords with you. Um, and it's also a good opportunity to talk about um, good password practices with your patrons. You want to encourage them to use strong, unique passwords and use a password manager or even a notebook to keep their um, passwords stored in. Um, I always try to be patient with password issues because it is a problem for many, many people. But I also try to consciously not like apologize for inconvenience about passwords. My natural... Um, you know, friendly self always wants to say, I'm so sorry, this is hard for you. And I try not to say that about passwords because I really want people to understand that passwords are really important. It's just as important to protect the password for your bank's, um, your bank account as it is to protect your social security number. So I, I never apologize if I can help it. I always say, you know, you really, we need to figure this problem out for you, but this is really important that you take care of this a little better in the future and be nice about it, of course. So if you decide to go the classes route, um, instead of doing just one-on-one -on -one appointments, you wanna teach some classes at your library, how do you decide what to teach? Um, first thing that I always think about is what are some of the library resources that we wanna promote? People really are interested in learning how to use Libby, learning how to use uh, Canopy is the video streaming service we have. Maybe it's Hoopla at your library. Uh, maybe you have LinkedIn Learning and you wanna teach people how to use that. So that's a great source for computer topics because you're, you're really getting more bang for your buck when you're promoting a library resource and you're also teaching the class at the same time. Um, so that's one area to look at. Um, Again, that notebook, if you're jotting down what kind of questions people are asking you, any common questions could be the subject of a class. Um, maybe it's popular software tools. Maybe you have someone on your staff that's really good at creating email um, address lists and they wanna share that skill with, with the community. Um, so here is, this list is just a few of the things that have been popular at my library in the last say two or three years. Uh, well, maybe a little longer because of the pandemic, but um, so email is, continues to be uh, an issue that people struggle with, depending on your community and what people are doing. Um, so even just basic email classes tend to still bring out a handful of people at my library. Um, transferring files between devices as people have more and more devices, smartphone, tablet, laptop, desktop, uh, whatever, they want to be able to move um, photos in particular between those devices. I get a lot of questions about phone storage and backups. Um, of course, there's always questions about scams. Um, I'm not a, a, you know, a legal advisor, but I do recognize how a lot of scams are presented online, especially. So I can teach some of that. I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of those things as well. But again, there's that like Bureau of Consumer Protection. You can reach out to some of those kinds of community partners to do those things. Your local police department will sometimes um, help you with some of those things. We did a, a partner program at, at our senior center once, the library and the county sheriff and the senior center did a program together about scams. And that was very um, well attended at the senior center. Um, how to do video streaming is always a popular class when I teach it at my library. That's one that um, it's it's a little more prep work for the library staff because streaming changes so frequently. And people really want to know, like, where do I get the football game or where do I watch Days of Our Lives and how much does it cost? So some of those kinds of details change so quickly, you really have to spend some time preparing for that kind of class. Um, another popular thing for me has been how to buy a new computer, what you're looking at when they when they list all those specs and the advertisements, what do they even mean? So, um, so these are just some ideas, um, nothing you have to do, obviously, but some things to think about. When you're planning for a class or a workshop, make sure you plan for a lot less material than you think you can cover. And I'm always guilty of this. I always try to make my outlines way too long uh, and try to cover too much material. You really need to keep it short because people just don't have the capacity to listen and learn these skills in, in huge blocks of time. So 
Um, when you're teaching something, take the time to prep to prepare in advance. For example, if you're teaching a class on how to use Libby, do your sample searches that morning so you know that you've got some titles that are like on the shelf at Libby that you could demonstrate how to check out an item. You want to break it down. You don't want to show someone on Libby how to find a material and then place a hold and then learn about what holds mean and all those things all at once. You want to break it down and have an example ready at your fingertips where you're just going to find a title and check it out and see how easy it is. And then you're gonna show them how to download that title to their device. And then you can la later on talk about holds. So be prepared and do your searches, you know, shortly before your class if you can, so that you know they're going to work for you. Um, I like to provide simple handouts for people so that they have something to take notes on. What I often do is, prepare for a class by just making an outline for myself of what I'm going to talk about. So I will simplify that outline and then leave a lot of white space in it so that people can take notes right on that outline if they choose to. Not everyone will, but for some people, that's a really great way to um, reinforce what they're learning about. Um, and then I often will record classes, just like I'm recording this one. I'm actually just running this as a Zoom meeting right now, and I'm using Zoom's recording feature. And then I'll be able to share this with you later. And I do that for my library as well. Um, I record something on Zoom, and then I put it on our library's YouTube channel and link it to our website. And then it's available for more people than we're able to actually attend the, the event itself. And when you're preparing for a class, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are some, some libraries out there. The Denver Public Library has some great resources out there um, for some digital training classes. Um, if there are class syllabi you can borrow from other libraries, do it. Libraries, you know, we all share and we love doing that. And there's no reason for you to create that from scratch. Um, most of your library digital services will have um, help materials available to you. So a lot of them like OverDrive has actual class syllabi that you can use when you're teaching people how to use OverDrive and Libby. Um, and most software and hardware vendors have the same thing. So if you look for, um, if you wanna teach a class about Android phones, Google has a great Android help section that can give you some um, basic demonstration pages. And I will often go look at one of those, even if it's a device I'm familiar with, because it will remind me, what do beginners need to know about this topic? And that'll help me prepare for my class too. And I've got some links at the end of this presentation that might help you get started on that. But of course, they change all the time as well. So no matter how you plan to deliver tech programs, whether you're doing one-on-one -on -one, um, appointments, whether you're doing drop-in programs, you're doing classes or workshops, the key factor is you. Um, the how do you make the experience good for your patrons? And it's going really beyond customer service and really demonstrating kindness, patience, and demonstrating a learning mindset. Um, letting people know that you may seem really smart about this topic, but nobody knows everything. And the most important thing is to be patient with yourself and patient with your patrons and learn how to find answers when you don't know them. And that's a great skill that you can um, take to any topic, but it's especially useful in technology because the answers to questions change so quickly. Every time there's a software update, it might be new. So um, it's good to demonstrate that for your patrons so that they understand that they have to be a little flexible in their thinking when they're learning their devices. It really is about um, more about attitude than it is about knowledge. You have to be patient, patient, patient. A lot of patrons that come to me at the library do have a family member close by or a friend or somebody that they could ask these questions of. But the family member just wants to jump in and fix the problem. They don't want to be patient and work the patron through the problem and help them understand how to fix it themselves next time. They need a person who is impartial and won't judge them and remind them that it's totally fine to come and ask me the same question next week if you forget the answer, because I don't mind. I really honestly do not mind. There are no stupid questions. And you really have to, everybody says that. Uh, but you really have to demonstrate to your patrons that you believe it, that you don't mind being bothered. There are some patrons that will test your patience. There are in every aspect of library work. Um, but do your best to be as patient as you can be. And remember that something that's obvious to you on a device that you've already been using is not necessarily obvious to other people. So be patient. What wait while people write things down and take notes. Um, older people that come to me with questions particularly like to do this. They take they take very detailed notes on things, and that's fine. I also try to remind them that you know things change a lot, so think about what your process is. Don't just memorize the steps if you can. 
Uh, sometimes I take a polite, you know, little peek over at their notes because sometimes I'll see them writing things down that aren't quite correct. So, you know, you have to just use your best judgment about how to handle those kinds of situations. But you want people to go home with the tools they need to practice and learn on their own. Um, again, provide simple explanations whenever you can and limit the number of topics in one session. I do have a lot of patrons that come with a notepad full of questions and they want to jump from one topic to the next. And I, I don't hesitate to say, we're not going to get to all of those questions today. We will to try to do six of them or whatever I think might be appropriate. And then you can make another appointment with, with me for next week or for the week after or whatever your personal library limits are if you decide to limit people's um, available appointment times. Um, and remember to start simple. There's no reason a patron needs to know everything on day one. You can start by showing them only a few features of the device or the software that they're trying to learn, and then expand on that at the next appointment too. And I love to give homework assignments. It's not really formal homework at all. But what I do tell people all the time is you need to go home and you need to practice this right now, not tomorrow, not even later this evening. I want you to go home and take half an hour if you can right now to practice it. Because when it's fresh in their minds, if they can reinforce it, it will stick better. Um, and sometimes I tell people, I'm going to be here all day. Why don't you have a seat at the table over there and practice it right now while you can still ask me questions about it? Um, because you really want to reinforce to people that they are learning. They're not just coming to you to fix the problem. They're coming to you to learn how to do it, do it themselves. And uh, homework is a good way to do that. Again, attitude, not knowledge. Searching is your friend. In Windows 10 and Windows 11, nobody knows where all the settings are. There's just too many of them. Every one of us who deals with Windows settings all the time just opens up the search bar and searches for that setting. Demonstrating for that to your patrons is sometimes very powerful. They think that you need to know where something is and they want to jot down, click here, click here, click here. It's much easier for everyone to just learn how to search. So, And that's true for all kinds of things, websites, your library catalog, your settings, all those things. Um, so show your patrons how to use the search features of their device, especially in the settings, um, and, and that will help them find what they need the next time. One part of searching is knowing the language, because if you're not searching for the right term, it's more difficult to find it, obviously. So be patient, but be clear with your patrons when they're calling something by the wrong name. Um, try to correct them when you can, because um, you want them to be able to find it the next time. And if they're not using the right name, they won't be able to very easily. Um, that doesn't mean you should use all the jargon. That means you should try to keep it as basic as you can, but make sure it's accurate as best you can. Uh, and then I never hesitate to demonstrate that learning mindset. I don't know the answer to that. Let's figure it out together. Or I need to check this. Just give me a minute. I'm going to look this up. I've got the library's iPad right here. I'm going to go search that just for a moment so I get it right before I explain it to you. And I never hesitate to do that. I want people to know that I don't know all the answers because then they feel more confident when they don't know the answer either. Oh, yeah, I saw Teresa search for that last time. I'll, I'll try that searching thing. Um, you're setting a good example for your patrons when you do that. And you're setting another good example of patience with yourself and with them. I, you know, I just don't remember. I know it's in here somewhere, but I can't remember right now. Let's see if we can search to find it. Because your end goal is that your patrons build their own confidence level so they can become better problem solvers without you. You don't want them showing up at your door every day with tech questions. You want to train them gradually on building their skills to solve their own questions, solve their own problems. Um, and that doesn't happen right away. And sometimes patrons that are just, you know, need the answer to a simple question, you may never see them again, and that's okay too. But you will get patrons that come to you regularly. And I've seen some of my patrons really increase their technology skills in the last couple of years because we talk about issues like how to approach the question, not just here's the answer, here are the steps to get to the answer. So it really does make a difference, I think. So that was a lot of information. I hope that it was helpful to you for planning your technology programs. Here's a few resources you might want to um, take a look at. I'm going to make these slides available to you, and they will be clickable links for you. So you can check those out. I mentioned um, the Denver Public Library has Libraries Learn, which is curriculum and resources for um, staff training and technology classes. 
Um, it looks pretty powerful. The um, ACRL framework for information literacy. So if you are doing some of those um, higher level information literacy courses, you might take a peek at that just to see um, what kinds of things are useful to be teaching. The Wisconsin Standards for Information and Technology Literacy, that's a K-12 resource, but if any of you are working with schools, um, that could be really valuable to you. Even if you're just doing like classroom visits, you might want to look and see what are the library skills that first graders are supposed to know. Um, and then I gave you a few examples of vendor-specific training sites. Most vendors have extensive tutorials and how-to videos and things like that. And those are good resources to direct your patrons to. They're also good resources for you to use when planning your classes. Um, and don't forget to use the resources that are available to your library. So you may have access to LinkedIn Learning. You may have access to Gale Courses or some of those other learning programs. Those um, are really powerful for building your skills and your staff skills. Um, so if you can find time for your, your staff to take some of those classes, that's awesome. If not, um, you can still look at the class outlines and, and see what kinds of things people are learning about them and use those class outlines when you're planning your own classes at the library. Obviously simplified because remember, we're keeping it easy for our patrons to learn a little at a time. And that's all I have for you today. I hope this was helpful. Um, as I said, uh, the presentation slides will be available to you online. And uh, I welcome your questions. So if you have any questions or thoughts or want to share anything with me, my email address and phone number are there on the screen. Thanks very much for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Teresa, for all of that awesome information. Please take the next 10, 15 minutes to pause this recording and answer the questions on your screen. You can also see the questions in the description area below. If you watched this webinar in its entirety and completed the questions, you have received one contact hour in public library certification. You will find an activity report in the description area. You will also find links to the slides as well as a survey. We would greatly appreciate your feedback. Thank you again for participating in one of our recorded webinars, Infinite Tech Questions, Itty Bitty Working Space. So long.